this morning and good to have the opportunity to talk to you. Susan and I are pondering some thoughts based on the Word of God. And the thoughts that I would like to share with you this morning spring from a really series of statements made by the Lord Jesus Himself as He delivered what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we're not going to read the entirety of the sermon. We're not going to read really the, even the entirety of the passage uh, that I'm thinking of. But I'll go ahead and note that the statements to which I refer, this series of statements that Jesus makes that I'm referring to, occur in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5. And of course, Jesus is here, has begun delivering this very famous sermon in which he is really speaking in anticipation of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, at the time Jesus spoke, at the time Jesus preached the sermon, the kingdom had not yet come. It would be coming, though. It would be the establishment of the kingdom would be taking place in the not too distant future from Jesus' perspective. You know, in my Bible, Matthew chapter 3 is in the same opening as Matthew chapter 5, and I can look back at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, and I can see where John the baptizer was going about declaring that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Matthew 4, after he had been tempted and after he had become preaching, as Jesus begins his ministry, he also declares the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That phrase, is at hand, is significant in that it has reference to something that is near, something close by. I might not be holding the screwdriver I need in my hand, but I might have it close at hand, or I can get to it. So the establishment of the kingdom that John and that Jesus spoke of was not something that was to take place hundreds or thousands of years in the future. Actually, it would be within the next three or so years after these words were spoken. In fact, later on in this three and a half year ministry that Jesus engaged in over Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, he told some of his followers there that some of you will not taste of death until the kingdom has come. So the kingdom has not come yet. But when Jesus goes upon this mountain to preach, he knows it's coming soon. And really what much of the Sermon on the Mount is about is teaching people about kingdom living. About things that they're going to need to know in order to be good citizens of the kingdom of God. And as you read through this sermon, Jesus makes it clear that he has the authority to say the things that he does on the subject. You know, we often note in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 how that when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he noted at that time that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. But you know, Really throughout his ministry, he had spoken as someone who would hold great authority. He spoke with authority. In fact, at the end of this sermon, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, it is written there that the people were astonished at his teachings. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. How would a scribe teach? Well, a scribe would just merely be passing along the decrees of God. He will be passing along the decrees that have been made by someone of higher authority than he. Not so with Jesus. Jesus spoke as the one who was the authority, who held the authority. And again, as I thought about this and putting these thoughts together and putting my notes together, I got to thinking about that. This Jesus of Nazareth, this very young man, 30 years old, that's young to me, that he's speaking with this great authority and people are knowing the authority with which he speaks. But of course, he was right to do so because of who he was. He was right to do so because according to the Father's purposes, he was to be set up as the king over this kingdom that he's speaking of in the sermon. When the time of his establishment arrived, Jesus will be set up on the throne. And so he was right to speak this way, to right to speak with such great authority, to impress upon people that it would be to his authority that they would be expected to submit in the kingdom. They were to live in the kingdom according to his will and according to his wishes. And I don't know where this assertion of such authority is seen any more clearly or maybe even blatantly than in the passage and in the series of statements 
that I'm making reference to this morning. The same series of statements that he begins making around verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5. And you probably will recognize the statements that he makes here. He, he, he does the journey on through the end of the chapter. And, and I'm talking about these six times in that period of, of Scripture, six times in which Jesus says something to the effect of, you have heard it said, or maybe it has been said, but he would say that. He would say, you have heard this said, but then what would he say immediately after he said what they heard? But I say to you, and what I got to thinking about recently, apart from the specifics, and the details of the various issues that he addresses in these verses, but I got to thinking about Jesus really in making the statements in addition to just passing along information, he's letting everyone know that in the kingdom, what will matter <laughs> on every subject pertaining to the kingdom, what will matter is what he says. Not what you've heard, no matter who you've heard it from. Whatever laws may have been observed on whoever's authority in times past, whatever they may have heard was... Uh, Whatever they heard that it was appropriate to do or what it was inappropriate to do, whatever source such things may have come from, he's letting folks know here, among other things, that in his kingdom, what will matter is not what they may have heard elsewhere at other times. What will matter is what he says in his kingdom as king. And that's a reminder. Now, I think we in the church need to be sure, but I certainly also believe that it's a reminder that many people in the religious world need to hear. Because today, many may be inclined to model their religious life after what they heard. Well, I guess we all do that, though, don't we? We all model our religious lives on what we've heard, and that may be all right. It just depends on who said it, who we heard it from. But as I look around at the religious world, and compare what's going on in the religious world with what I know the Lord has said, I see a lot of discrepancy between the two. They don't, they don't line up like they ought to. I'm hearing people say a lot of things about Christianity, people who profess Christianity, but I'm hearing people say a lot of things about Christianity and about the church and about the Lord and about serving the Lord that, that just doesn't jive with what I find in the scriptures. With what I find the Lord Jesus has said. And again, we've done this many times, but it's always good to remember this. I want to talk a little bit about what I mean when I say what Jesus says. I'm not saying that Jesus, that I have a direct line to Jesus. I'm not saying that Jesus speaks verbally to me or to you or to anyone else. He doesn't do that anymore as he did in times past, for example, with Paul at certain times when he was very discouraged. But Jesus speaks to me today. He speaks to everyone today through the inspired word that he had been put down in writing. And I'm not, most of you know this, I'm not just talking about what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote about what Jesus actually said, what he verbally spoke. Remember, always remember this, Jesus himself Jesus himself said that what he taught during his ministry does not constitute the entirety of his teachings. I believe we see that in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 12. We talked about this, this thing before. Now that he told the apostles that night that he was about to go away. But he also told them, and, and this is just hours, a very short time. A very short time later, he would be arrested, he would be tried, and he would be crucified. And on that night, in John chapter 16 and verse 12, he told the apostles, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, I haven't taught you everything yet. You don't know everything you need to know yet, but you can't bear it right now. And of course, he goes on in the following verses to tell them that the Holy Spirit would come and he would guide them in the altar. He would make known to them all that Jesus wants them to and really, what he wants the rest of us as well to know. The apostles and certain others would receive such knowledge through the Holy Spirit. And they would 
teach what they had learned from the Spirit. They would write it down, and it would be preserved through the ages, even down to the day in which we live. To the Ephesian brethren, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul knows that anyone can understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ when they read. When they read what has been preserved and handed down. Verse 5 of that text, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 5 tells us that, that this information has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said would happen in John 16, isn't it? It has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit and has been made known to his holy apostles and prophets. And again, these prophets of which Paul speaks here are not they're like Moses and Isaiah. He's speaking of what we might refer to as New Testament prophets. Those who were not apostles, the, the apostles are mentioned there as well. And he's talking about some that were not apostles, but who were also moved by the Holy Spirit to write certain things that the Lord wanted preserved. Think of men like Luke. Think of somebody like uh, John Marker as well in that regard. But I said all of this just to remind us that Jesus is still saying things that we need to take into consideration when we hear someone make a declaration concerning the religion of Christianity. He's speaking to us through the entirety of the New Testament. And it doesn't matter. What it is that we've heard, it doesn't matter. Who it is that we've heard it from, if it doesn't agree with what Jesus said, it's not right. It's not a valid religious principle, we must say. You know, a lot of people said that doctrine doesn't matter. That's really kind of whether it's stated or not. I think it's a belief that applies to those in the denominational world, those that uh, associate themselves with the ecumenical. That will embrace all faiths, whatever that word you have to pronounce. But doctrine doesn't really matter. So you can see it in what people do really, but I'll tell you what, if you're like me, you've heard it. You've heard people say that. I have actually heard from the lips of men who profess to be gospel preachers that doctrine is not that important. I heard one say, I don't want to be bothered with doctrinal questions or doctrinal issues, again, because it's just not that important. What the church teaches and practices just is not a big deal. Right off the bat, I think of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Remember there, he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? And again, Jesus says something very different than this in his New Testament. For example, in 2 John 9, 2 John is that little book near the end of the New Testament, one chapter long. So when I say 2 John 9, I mean 2 John verse 9. But in 2 John 9, the Apostle John writes there that whoever transgresses or goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. But he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. That doesn't sound to me like doctrine doesn't matter. It sounds a lot to me like doctrine does matter. And I get the same impression from the Apostle Paul. And again, with Paul, like John, you're talking about one of the Lord's hand-picked ambassadors. And when Paul was writing to the young preacher Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul noted there that there were some who needed to be charged, literally, Commanded, there were some that needed to be commanded to teach no other doctrine. And that would be in line with the attitudes of the first century Christians. I've noted before in these three little books of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, three relatively short books written to young preachers, all mentions doctrine at least 15 times. And think about the first converse to the thing. First Congress of Christianity that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. How that at the time of the establishment of the church, we read of these brethren continuing steadfastly in, among other things, there's a list of things in verse 42, but one of the things that's listed is the Apostles' Doctrine. And let's be sure we understand that the Apostles' Doctrine 
is not a doctrine that would be distinct from the doctrine of Christ. Really, that is just another term to refer to the doctrine of Christ. It is the doctrine and the only doctrine that Jesus taught these men through the Spirit. I don't think that Jesus taught to anyone. Most of you here know that I like to take note of Luke's verbiage here. And then he says they continue to the apostles, plural, doctrine, singular. Meaning that there was only one doctrine that all the apostles taught. Jesus taught them all the same thing, and they all taught that one doctrine. It's the same doctrine that John referred to in 2 John. There are lots of stuff in the like this. But I haven't done something like this before. And it's a listing of every last time that I can find with my software. Every last time that I can find that the word doctrines, plural, appears in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7, those are very similar accounts of the same thing, where Jesus is criticizing the scribes and the Pharisees for teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They were teaching men's thoughts and teaching them as doctrines, different doctrines. In Colossians chapter 2, all there is thinking of these useless religious regulations that would be imposed by some. And he says they would be imposed according to the doctrines of men. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul there speaks of a certain time when brethren would be led away from the truth by deceiving spirits and doctrines of, me, of demons. And then of course Hebrews 13, verse 9. It instructs all of us not to be carried about with various and strange doctrines. What I'm getting at is that every time that doctrines is mentioned in the plural of the New Testament, it's in a negative light. You may have heard, many of us have heard, that doctrine doesn't matter. Jesus says that it does. And the only doctrine that should be taught and should be practiced is the one that has been given by him through the Spirit to the inspired apostles and prophets. Now, in a setting where many believe that doctrine doesn't matter, if you think about it, it should not be surprising then that we may we would hear it say said at some point that the type of church that you attend doesn't matter either. Many of us have heard it said. And continue here, it said that you should attend the church of your choice. Because after all, which church you go to really doesn't matter that much. I mean, you might see this even printed in newspapers sometimes. When I was growing up, there was a weatherman that I used to watch on the TV down in Huntsville. And when he would close off his weather forecast on Friday, on Saturday night, I was saying, make sure you go to the church of your choice tomorrow. So many of us have heard this. But again, the question that we need to ask after hearing this. Is that what Jesus said? Now the statement itself assumes a multiplicity of churches with equal legitimacy and standing before the Lord. That is assumed in that statement. But the New Testament through which Jesus speaks to us today, well, it tells us or it I, I guess I should put it this way. It doesn't grant that assumption. It does not grant the assumption that there are a multiplicity of churches with equal standing before him. The New Testament speaks of one church. The church. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, the inspired apostle Paul writes that there is one body. But we're talking about the church. Yes. You see, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, 23, Paul notes that it is the church that is the body of Christ. And so when Paul says in chapter 4 that there is one body, he's saying there's one church. There is only one. We sometimes refer to this as the universal church, as it is the single church to which all of the saved are added, all of the saved belong to. We refer to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 a minute ago. You look down at the end of that chapter, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Luke writes there that the Lord was adding to the church, the church daily, those who were being saved. So the church that the New Testament speaks of, the universal church, 
is comprised of all the saved people. And it speaks of it as one church. Now I know, we all know, that there are instances where the writers of the New Testament make reference to a plurality of churches. In Acts 15 and verse 41, we read of Paul strengthening the churches of Syria and Cilicia. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 2, we read that Paul was writing that letter to the churches of Galatia. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul commits the Thessalonian brethren and how that they had been imitators of the churches in Judea. What we find is that there are various assemblies and various assembly places of the people that comprise the Lord's church, singular church. But this plurality of assemblies, as we've been noted more than once before, was the result of, the way I like to put it, geographic necessity, geographic reality. It was not the result of doctrinal diversity. Brethren in Jerusalem, or Antioch, it doesn't matter which Antioch you're talking about, we find it difficult to worship regularly with the brethren at Ephesus on Corinth, which were many, many miles away. And so, even as we do today, they met, the Christians of the first century, met with other members of the church who were in their vicinity. But they were all part of that one church and practicing and teaching that one doctrine. There is no indication that those different groups in different locations were practicing different things and teaching different things and worshiping in different ways. In fact, just the opposite. We noted a moment ago that all the apostles taught the same doctrine. Paul would be included in that. He wasn't one of the original twelve, but he later became an apostle. So he would teach the same doctrine. Jesus would not teach Paul a different doctrine than he taught the others. But not only did they all teach the same doctrine, something that Paul says to the Corinthian brethren sheds some light on how, how consistent they were in teaching that doctrine. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he writes there, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways of Christ, as, as I teach everywhere and in every church. Now, I've asked this question before. Paul teaches the same thing everywhere and in every church. Do you think he can get away with that in this meeting? Do you think I can get away with that with going to every church and preaching the same thing that I preach here? I wish I could, but I don't know how well that would be received. The church with which I choose to affiliate myself matters. And quite frankly, from my point of view, I don't know that it's appropriate to talk about the church of my choice. You know, thinking about this one church, do you remember in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 how Jesus described that church? There he said, it's mine. Upon this rock, I will build my church. It belongs to him. And so I don't believe it's my place to say that I can choose a church based on my personal preferences or that you can do the same. You have heard it said that you should be a part of the church of your choice. But Jesus says you should be a part of the church of his choice. His church, the one that matches the church that we see in the New Testament. The one that we aspire to be. And again, as I like to say, I, I'm not going to make the claim that we're there yet, and we're the ones that everybody ought to be anyway, but that's what we're aspiring to. That's what we're working toward. And that matters. And closely related to the notion of attending the church of your choice is the notion of worshiping the Lord in whatever manner you choose, in the way that you see fit. In fact, yeah, I say this related to the previous one because you think about it. For a lot of people, what a large factor in them deciding in what church they're going to go with will be how that church worships. I've heard people say that. And so they're looking for some place where, where the worship will appeal to them. Just find one, find a church whose worship style fits your personal taste. You have heard it said that there 
is no wrong way to worship God, so worship Him however you see fit with all your heart. I've heard it said. But again, though it really, it kind of has a nice sound to it when you first hear it. But again, did you hear that from Jesus? The fact is that the scriptures have shown us in every era of man's history that how man worships God has always mattered to God. It's not just a matter of worshiping the right God. You need to worship the right God, but you need to worship Him in the right way. In the patriarchal era, that earliest era of man's history, we see two brothers, Cain and Abel. First two men that were born on the earth. And they're offering acts of, they're offering sacrifices. They're engaging in acts of worship to God in Genesis chapter 4. But we are told there that, that God respected Abel's offering, but he did not respect Cain's offering. And again, just quickly going through this process that we've gone through numerous times together. In Hebrews chapter 4, that's in Hebrews 11 verse 4, I guess I'm in a hurry. But um, Hebrews 11 verse 4 tells us that Abel's offering was better than Cain's because he offered it in faith. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. According to Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so while we don't know all the details of what Abel did that Cain didn't do and vice versa. We don't know all the details of what God said with how to offer these sacrifices, but what we do know from these passages is that worship was accepted by God when it was offered in accordance with what he had spoken at that time. Cain shows us that even in those earliest days of history, there was a wrong way to worship. Move forward through history to the Mosaic era that era in which the law of Moses was in effect in the nation of Israel. And you see this very well again. Many of you may immediately think, like I did, of Nadab and Abihu in this regard. Priests of God, in fact, among the first priests that had been appointed over the people of Israel. Luke, Leviticus chapter 10 records the tragic deaths of these two men. And I call it tragic because it couldn't have been avoided. It should have been avoided if only they had carried out their acts of worship in accordance with the Lord's law that had been given to the people. The text indicates they had not done this. You had to worship in God's way. Still thinking about those that lived under the Mosaic law, I'll talk about what is said in Deuteronomy chapter 12 when God mentioned that not only did you need to worship in the proper way, but of course in Israel, you had to worship at the proper times. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 12, you had to worship at the right place. There was a place that the Lord designated once they settled in the land where their sacrifices were to be brought. So not only were they required to worship in the right times, in the right, in the right ways, but even in the right place. Coming to Christianity, the era in which we live. Now Jesus did tell the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, that in his era, the era of Christ, in his kingdom, the place of worship would not matter. But you know what still would matter, even in his kingdom? Worshiping properly still would matter. He says in verse 24 of that text, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit, I think that means with their hearts, with their whole hearts, and in truth. According to what God has revealed through His Word, which is the truth, according to what He has revealed that He wants when it comes to our worship. The preacher for Tanya and the kids and I worship down in Alabama just before we moved up here. He was fond of saying quite often at the outset of a worship service that we are not the audience here today. God is the audience. And all that we do here should be done with a view to pleasing Him and not ourselves. You may have heard that how we worship doesn't matter as long as we worship from the heart. You have heard it said that there is no wrong way to worship God. But Jesus, what Jesus Himself has said, and what is borne out by both the Old and the New Testaments, is that worship must be practiced according to his wishes by the authority granted in the pages of his New Testament. Bottom line is, as we
we pursue our relationship with God, as we pursue a relationship with God, and as we seek to develop that relationship with God, we've got to do all that as He directs. Now, God wants a relationship with everyone else, and He wants a relationship with everyone else out there. And He offers tremendous benefits to those who will come to Him and, and, and join Him in this relationship. But it has to be entered into according to His will. We can approach God. We've got to do it His way. But so many nowadays want to have a relationship with God on their own terms. Again, that's something that I actually heard a young lady say once. When we worshiped out in the southern part of the state, I remember a young lady say that I want a relationship with God, but I want it on my terms. Say something. Pursuit of such a relationship with Him in which the relationship is built on your terms is flawed. Because in that relationship and in that scenario, you know who the Lord is? You are the Lord in a scenario like that. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, and for that of Romeo, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, says that there's only one Lord. And I want to hasten to remind every one of us. Part of the vernacular, but we ain't in. It is only through submission. Submission to the will of Christ. And submission means you do things His way, even if you would do things otherwise if you were in charge. It is only through submission to Christ's Lordship that you can have a relationship with God. He wants us to approach it, He wants us to get to it, but we will only do that His way. In the age before GPS, a person might need help finding a way to get to a certain place. A person might come up to me in those days and ask, how do I get here? I need to go to this place. I might, I might give him the red and tell where to go, what they want to look for. Or I might draw him a map. Somebody once asked Jesus how to get to God. How to get to the Father's house. In John chapter 14, Thomas asked Jesus that. He said, Lord, show us the way. We do not want the way. Jesus, I heard her in my book, this one once that it really me. When Thomas asked him the way to the Father, Jesus didn't draw on the map. Jesus just pointed at himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The Lord has established his terms for a relationship with him and access to the Father as he's revealed in the entirety of the New Testament. Now we talked a bit about the details of these terms last week, or less than last week. Uh, and, and, and coming to that relationship with him does involve doing certain things in order to enter that relationship. And of course, even after you've entered a relationship, it involves living a certain way, doing some things, not doing other things, in order to keep that relationship in good standing. You may have heard that you can approach God on your own terms, but you didn't hear it from Jesus. Jesus says, you go through me, you do it my way. You may hear many different voices telling you many different things with regard to Christianity, maintaining this relationship between oneself and God. But the only voice you really need to listen to is the voice of Jesus. And as it turns out, he's going to tell you something different than what you might hear from a lot of these other things. The question at that time becomes, who are you going to believe? I believe you. I believe Jesus. Thank you for your attention this